Well, hello, and again, welcome uh, to be able to join us for another uh, chapter in the book of Acts as we're working our way through uh, one week at a time, just taking a, a moment for Bible study each week. Uh, something a little exciting this week, actually, where we are at in our uh, study of the book of Acts for our Bible study is actually going to match up with where we are at in our sermon series for the big church that we're talking about. So maybe this week you'll get a little bit of an insight moving into the scripture that we'll look at together on Sunday. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, keep coming back every single week. And uh, again, let us know if you have any questions that are out there that we can address as we move through the book. Uh, with that today, we're going to start with uh, chapter 15, once again, uh, beginning at verse 1. Reading from the NIV. Yep. Uh, some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, as, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So we kind of just open up with, a, I guess, a general welcome, maybe a little uh, background as to where we're going in the book. You can see, obviously, that there's this issue that has been brought up within the church. And so uh, the two individuals. Disagreement. Paul and yeah. A doctrinal, yeah. A doctrinal disagreement. Which is interesting how they uh, go about solving it, right? They say, well, we're going to take some of our experts, if you will, these people who, who know this, and we're going to send them there to be able to be able to well basically speak to the issue anything in there that you see beside the kind of the opening pastor mark it's just the, <laughs> it's just the uh well the whole topic really for this chapter i think of just today how fragmented the body of christ is denominationally yeah you know there's so many literally thousands maybe ten thousand actually denominations of christianity a which lot. is yeah and it's all everybody's got their own little thing like, no, 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 we have to have church on Saturdays. It's not good. To, so there's a whole denomination that that's their focus. They only worship on Saturdays. Yeah. There's a, you know, no, you can't dance or drink any alcohol. No, we got our own little denomination. We're going to focus on this. Or, um, yeah, and so here you've got some Jewish believers in Jesus, uh, still very strong in their probably Pharisee teachings, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but believed it. Jesus was the son of the God, died for his, their sins, uh, but just held on so tightly to the tradition, the culture that they grew up in, the things that were important to them, like circumcision as a sign of being in God's family. And so they went off kind of on their own. This is obviously without kind of James and Peter and the kind of these apostles, kind of head of the Jerusalem church, uh, without their uh, blessing. Mm -hmm. you know, they just kind of said, oh, we're, we hear these Gentiles are you know, coming to faith. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Let's help them out. <laughs> yeah. And really, I'm sure that was, they I wanted think that to was, help. That was the, yeah. they're, they're not doing this to be <clears throat> mean or anything. Yeah, they think this is right. Man, this is great. The God's bringing even Gentiles into his family. Let's make sure they understand what, you know, how to actually be in God's family. They've got to be circumcised. Well, there's something that's... that's funny with this, right? Maybe I'll just read verse yeah. 5 real briefly because it attaches on to it. Uh, it says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So just as you were saying, Pastor Mark, they're saying, you know, well, you have to do this. You have to, what, I guess, convert to Judaism in order to kind of kind of follow this. It's almost as you would see maybe some uh, congregations today even say, hey, to become maybe some places that are really strict, to become a member of our congregation or something like that, you have to follow these very specific ways to be able to do certain things. Yeah. Now, it's maybe very different as this is super law-oriented, but you can see even early on in the church, like you mentioned, these issues still exist with people saying, well, you need to do this. Again, uh, rights that have been 
more uh, established in some ways and followed just by men. Of course, circumcision was a, a huge covenant that God gave to his people. But now at this point within scripture, there's this very different covenant with yeah. Christ that is being ignored. And so that's something important for us to remember, too, as we read this. It's not that circumcision uh, was not important, especially at one point within Scripture, that it wasn't a huge deal. Uh, but now there is this, this different uh, time element that is there, especially with the sacrifice that Christ has made for these individuals. Yep, the new he instituting the new covenant, right, for all people. All right, you want to pick up on Next verse... paragraph there, verse 6. Yeah. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. So they gave it serious consideration. And after much discussion, now, I don't know how many of us have been in a, a voters meeting where there was much discussion mm -hmm. or maybe a council or yeah. board meeting where there's much discussion. It's healthy. Uh, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts, how? By faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? Hmm. That's a great point. That's a powerful statement. And he comes out with this emphatic no. Absolutely not. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we are saved, just as they are. And uh, you see... The struggle that we even have today, even good old Lutherans who, who focus so much on saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, yeah, um, we all have this human tendency to want to do something. Mm -hmm. It gives us a sense of control. Yep. Uh, it gives us some kind of sense that uh, we've earned it. Like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I know I'm in God's family because I fill in the blank. Pray the sinner's prayer. I mm. got baptized. I don't drink or dance. So I'm living like a holy life. I, yeah, I did all these things. Right. And uh, Peter, who, remember, it was Peter and Paul that first had friction about Jews and Gentiles and coming to the church. Now, Peter, who was uh, strong, you know, uh, emphasizing spreading the gospel to his Jewish people, now he's come completely, not, not that he's come co completely around, but he's, he's very vocal and very adamant about no this this by we're saved by grace yeah. it's nothing to do with our jewish heritage like a birthright that was given to abraham it's nothing to do with following the law of moses uh because even we can't wear that yoke uh, the law is not going to save anybody this is a great piece uh <clears throat> as he goes in there and you know even talks about you know that uh, that God made this choice for me to declare from my lips. He says, you know, that the, this isn't a mission that, that we're telling you guys, or this isn't an idea that we're like, hey, we could get more people if we open it up to these Gentiles. You know, he says, no, this is God that made this decision for all people to be able to hear this message. And, man, like you, you said, the, the fact that he says uh, uh, – He's made no distinction between us. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? You know, being able to say that all these people who have come before us have tried to do all of these things, like you mentioned, to try to say, no one can do it. You know, no one can right. do it. So why these poor guys, if you're really trying to help them out, you know, let's not say that they have to do more things in order to be saved and have that in their mind. You know, let's focus on that word that we come back to here, this, this concept of grace. And how important is this for people in our day and age to hear? Uh, we talk a lot about it in church, Pastor Mark and I open up with those words uh, before our message usually for the day. We talk about it in our prayers. It just, it, this is something, a concept that I don't think uh, can get old and you can't repeat it too much because we as sinners, uh, no matter who you are, think constantly have it in our minds that 
we are going to do something, that we have these grandiose plans, and then maybe even on the other side of the coin, that we've done something that's too bad that God can't forgive, or we get down on ourselves so much that, look how much I failed uh, again. And we do need to have knowledge of those things, that the law is upon our hearts, but we have to come back to that grace element at the same time, too, and make sure that that is never forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. By grace, then verse 9, uh, God purified their hearts by faith, mm. right? They have faith in Jesus, and that's all we need. That's all they need. Yeah. Don't put a yoke that we can't even bear. <laughs> Interesting there that purify their hearts by faith because we even hear about in scripture like the circumcision of the heart, right? Making kind of like that parallel road that's that's there. Maybe not this physical act, but that God is doing it through faith in, in a variety of other ways. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so that kind of ends that little section there. We kind of break off into this, this new one here. Uh, this declaration is made, and then in verse 12, it says, The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, that they have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by eyelids, idols, from sexual morality, from the meat of <coughs> strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and, and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Uh, interesting there that we get another voice, you know, that, that speaks up here. Uh, we see, you know, these two men of Paul and Barnabas being able to speak, but then we see James coming to the table and being able to back these guys up. He comes forth, and as I love, again, in the book of Acts, he goes back to Scripture and says, you know, look yes. at this. You, you guys know this stuff. This is very common. We talk about the word of the Lord. Let's go back to Scripture and see exactly what God has, has said. And there it is, right? Even mentioning the Gentiles that are in there. Right, yeah. It goes back to, it quotes Amos, Old Testament prophet. Uh, just one of many places where God tells Israel that he loves all people. He was going to save all people. He's just chosen Israel to be the special family that mm. uh, the Messiah is going to come through. And so he, you know, preserves them, protects them. I think uh, pretty cool that during this church debate, uh, I don't know how, can, how much of a conflict or maybe not, not a fight, but everybody kind of gets up and has their, their peace. Everybody kind of has their turn to speak. Their opportunities to say something. Yeah. That, like the earlier verse where they said they discussed this for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so they took, they took, everybody respected everybody else's kind of position, where they mm -hmm. were coming from, mm -hmm. what their concerns were. And uh, it wasn't like uh, Peter or James, somebody with like this a lot of authority, you know, at least unofficially, whatever, the respect, you know, just stood up and said, nope, this, this is the way it's going to be. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. that was too loud. You guys be quiet. This is, right, this is the ultimatum. We are not going to circumcised Gentiles. And that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that shows that uh, a willingness to seek the truth and to bring people along with you. And again, especially when it's when you're standing on God's word and to be constantly bringing, it, bringing people back to, well, what has God told us? What has God promised us? What are, what are examples that God's given us? And it's persuasive. It works. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they you know they, they take away that element of circumcision that's there, and I love that he mentions it. Right? Let's not make it difficult for these people who are turning to God. And isn't that a maybe something is the church today that we really need to take to heart? Right? Are we making it at times too difficult 
for individuals to be able to hear the word of the Lord, people that are that are interested. You know, what barriers do we put up? And sometimes without even knowing it, and not because we're trying to be malicious, but what things do we put in place that maybe we think, well, this has to happen or that has to happen, that may hold people back from being able to, to really hear the word of the Lord and to know Christ as their Savior. And I think as Christians, we've got to be careful of those things. I mean, you don't open the floodgates and just say, you know, everything goes here, this is how it is, mm-hmm. to try to do that. You have to have, as we see, even in the next verse, they said, you know, actually, let's mention these, I think, four things that are in there that would be really good for the Gentiles. You know, it mentions uh, sexual immorality, and that was like a huge sin that uh, the people of this culture dealt with all the time and that they knew was not appropriate. And said, so if you want to give them something to do, let's, let's not mention like the circumcision. Let's mention this, this other sin that they are struggling with and go from there. And maybe for our society too, maybe the same thing, you know, do we really need to focus on on this that is just a, a something we're trying to say people should do to be able to enter the church or to be able to become a part of our family? Or do we really need to talk to them about this sin that actually exists over here and, you know, mention those things? So maybe a good point for us today, too, of thinking about, uh, we talk about us as a big church, how are we doing and being able to open up uh, that arena to hear God's word and not holding people back? Yep. Yeah, remove the barricades, block anything that would hinder anyone from hearing the gospel. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, all right, so the council's letter to the Gentile believers. This is kind of cool. Uh, after they've had this long discussion, uh, they've come to a consensus based on the Word of God, mm-hmm. based on the testimony that they've seen the Holy Spirit give the gifts, the faith to Gentiles, just like they had to the Jews. They said, okay, we, we've, got, uh, we've got an agreement here. We can send some advice back to Antioch. So, verse 22. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church, right, whole church, decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them, they sent the following letter. And then we actually get a uh, photocopy of the letter that they sent to Antioch, which Mm. is pretty cool. It says, The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings! We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. <laughs> I'm going to start sending my letters like my emails. Just yeah. farewell. Greetings. <laughs> farewell. <laughs> Seems so simple. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things that they're recommending here when they talk about abstaining from food sacrifice to idols, yeah. blood, animals that are strangled, and sexual immorality, I think even maybe this will be shocking to some people, but even sexual morality, all four of these things were a part of pagan, pagan worship, worship yeah. practices. Oh yeah. So I think uh, more than even you're yeah you're right. They weren't trying to say okay you don't have to be circumcised, but these are rules you do have to follow. Well, their point was you don't have to be circumcised. You're saved by faith. And yeah. now Because you know now that you're saved by faith, this is really how you should respond to not confuse anybody mm-hmm. around you. Mm-hmm. So your your former pagan brother or cousin or neighbor, if you keep outwardly practicing that those kind of worship behaviors, yep. how are they going to realize that you have changed your worldview, that you have faith in Jesus now? And for your Jewish brothers and sisters, you'll be offending them yeah. by doing, yeah. I didn't think about that, right? I mean, think about something that was sacrificed to a false god. I mean, that it almost seems like there's uh, not just this conflict of interest that's there. It actually seems dangerous 
to me. You know, these false gods, you know, they aren't just uh, a fictitious maybe being in the sky. You're talking potentially about Satan and demons messing Mm -hmm. with people to try to get them to believe or become distracted from the Lord. And so, yeah, for a variety of reasons, especially what you mentioned, and so maybe, again, to put it in practical terms, it's good for us as Christians to know the freedoms that we have, but to be, uh, I think, just mindful would be the best word of how we're using those freedoms in the world. Not that it's bad, I think, to, to look and act like other people in some ways. You don't have to be the, this oddball, but also to be set apart by God and to know what that means. So when people do see us living as Christians, uh, they think, you know, why, why is that? Why doesn't that individual do that? Why doesn't he or she participate in this? Uh, and, you, and you know that that does make you stand apart. You shouldn't preach something, and I'm not just saying this for us as pastors, any Christian, you shouldn't preach something in your word or claim to be a Christian and then do something very different, you know, on the on the side. We got to be careful yeah. of that. Yeah, definitely. Good. All right. Uh, after the letter here, a few more verses. It says uh, the this is verse thirty, by the way. Uh, the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. I think about what that must have looked like. You know, they show up, letter in hand. And they say, you know, there's almost an apology element to it, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, we're sorry that this went out, but let us tell you what we're saying here. Mm -hmm. Judas and Silas, who were themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So kind of a good little wrap-up, uh, at least here, uh, as we come to an end of delivering this letter. Uh, I like it because there's a good solution that's provided, right? It shows that solutions can be had, even if people come to this this disagreement. And just knowing that disagreements or differencing in opinion is a part of our life as human beings and as Christians. And that's true uh, in, the, in a friendship. It's true in a marital relationship. It's true on a, a spiritual realm with us and other Christians. But the crux there is making sure that in those elements we do not sin, right? We're not coming uh, underneath our anger or rage or that we're not calling somebody names or turning our backs upon them, but that we are looking to see, you know, at the end of the day, what is God's will in this scenario? What does God's word say about mm-hmm. this? And how can we come together to make sure his mission is being accomplished? Yeah, that's absolutely. That's really good. I like how the church in Jerusalem, uh, so there was this confusion, this disturbance. They're trying to make it right, smooth it over, clarify. And they wrote a nice letter, and Paul and Barnabas were headed that way anyway. He could just mailed it with them. Yeah. Right? And that would have communicated it. But I think I really like uh, that they sent Judas and Silas from the church in Jerusalem to Antioch yeah. to travel there to testify by word of mouth what we're writing in this letter. Yeah. Um, there's something about, even today, where we've got text text messages and emails so flying around hundreds of them a day if you're if you're still working like we are it's a uh the, the communication we have today is just, it's constant it's mm-hmm. constant but even today nothing replaces a face-to-face yeah. meeting a face-to-face conversation and especially when there's some tension mm-hmm. whether uh whether maybe there was some disagreement in this situation, or maybe there was just some offense. The the Christians in Antioch, were, their feelings were hurt, and the Christians in Jerusalem were saying, "We're really sorry. We, that's not. We didn't approve that, and yeah. we're really sorry it happened." Let me, you know, make amends. But sending people in person, mm-hmm. and you have two, so you got the two witnesses came yeah. from the Old Testament, right, to say this is the letter that everybody in the church agreed with. Uh, there's just still, even today, there's no. Absolutely no replacement for uh, that face-to-face. Mm. All right, should we wrap with our last little piece here? We think everything's going great, and it is, but... All right. <laughs>
Paul Paul's itching to get on a second missionary journey. Yep. He's ready to roll. Oh, can we take it? Yeah, you're 30, up. 30, 36. Six, yeah. Uh, sometime later, so we don't know exactly how long, but sometime later, uh, Paul said to Barnabas, Hey, let's go back uh, and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Uh, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he, that's John Mark, had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. In other words, John Mark kind of bailed on them in the middle of the first missionary trip. I know a Mark like that. Really? <laughs> a John Mark? Yeah. Yeah. They had such a sharp disagreement. Think about that. Paul and Barnabas, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Interesting, like he's mentioned, this sharp disagreement. These guys have just solved this problem with these other Christian brothers, and then they get into it over one individual that one wants to bring with them to hopefully help. And the other guy says, hey, this guy bailed on me. can't count on he's, him. Yeah, he's out of here. And I see both, I, I can see the perspective of both individuals, right? Like, uh, I want somebody who's faithful to us, who's not going to bail on us, but I also want to give people a, a second chance. And it's nice to have another set of hands to be able to do, especially missionary work, right? Yeah. And they're talking about something so good, yet they have this huge disagreement and they literally break up, if you you will. This bromance between mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas, is, it seems like it's over here. Mm-hmm. But something happens out of this, right? I mean, there's there's an effect that's here. Yeah. Well, for one, now you've got two missionary teams. Mm-hmm. One's covering Cyprus. The other one's going towards Cilicia um, in the same time frame. So they're doubling their whatever output, if you think about it that way. And uh, later on, and maybe we'll cover it, but in several of Paul's letters to the churches, he sends his greetings and he commends uh, even even John Mark, but certainly Barnabas uh, later in his life. He, mm-hmm. He's still, at least maybe by the end of his life, thought highly of them and <laughs> yeah, yeah. appreciated their work for the gospel. I mean, he's just a, a hard-headed guy, I think, in a lot of ways, right? And uh, I don't know, it, it just goes to show that there are these things, but... Uh, as you mentioned, even in our disagreements that we have, not that we want to shoot for these things, they do create a solution, right? They mm-hmm. both don't give up and say, you're right, you know, this is this is it. They actually still both go do work for the Lord and go out to complete these missionary journeys. And actually, both of them, they kind of compromise. What did you tell me about compromise one time? It's a, you come to this conclusion where neither party wins. Is that what you told me, I think? So, or each party oh, uh, gives something? You uh, mentioned, it's one of your words of wisdom to me <laughs> at some point. Yeah, they're really good. I remember most of them. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think about that in these terms, right? They, they both give something. Paul gets to go without John Mark. Mm-hmm. And also, John Mark gets to go on a mission journey. And I always saw this, and I've seen it written a couple times, this is like this multiplication through division that God uses, right? And we see that, I think, many times throughout Scripture. Then in a moment where we'd see like, oh no, this is supposed to be God's word going out to all these churches. Paul was going to go check on them again. You know, what's, what's going to happen? Well, the Lord still uses even this moment to be able to expand his mission with the people. Yeah, I think it's uh, important where there's a disagreement and even a parting of ways, but they are both still doing the Lord's work. Yeah, yeah. wherever they end up. Yeah, and I see that I have seen it in ten years, right, in congregations. Sure. Where the congregation, I'll just pick on a. I won't, I won't confirm or deny if it's my church in Chattanooga, but where. <laughs> Let's say a congregation, the majority of the congregation says, you know what, our, our Lutheran school is going to be our number one mission. Mm-hmm. And this is what we're going to focus on. And there may be a small number of people that say, no, we, you know, we're, I don't want to waste, pour the money into that. Yep. I don't want to. And they part ways over a difference of kind of vision where God feels like they're leading them. But if the people who are parting end up in another Christian and Lutheran Christian, even better church 
and you know this church is still doing God's mission over here. There they found another yeah. church that's more aligned with where God's calling them, what they're passionate about. That's good. It is good, uh, and it, I think that's better than having them here, where there's just always this friction, 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 about trying to move forward in God's mission. I mean, I've always even told individuals that, right? When they say, you know, sometimes it comes to the point where somebody decides they're going to transfer their membership to another church, and just as uh, much as I want to see our congregation grow. Uh, most importantly spiritually but of course by numbers too that's that's great for a congregation to see causes momentum there's evidence that's there at the end of the day i don't want to tell that person no you need to you need to stay with us if they're trying to say hey for my spiritual life or even our just our my personal uh scenario right now i've moved 50 miles away from you if it's better for you to be able to still be in a church and to be growing uh, I'm not going to be the person in heaven on the last day saying, oh, yeah, I held that person back from their spiritual growth because I wanted to make sure we had a couple extra people on the rolls at the end of the day. You know, that's the, the most important. You don't want people leaving the faith, but like you said, what is the, uh, the works Lord, the Lord's work can always be done in any of these scenarios. We just got to be right. careful not to, not to hold him back or to let our own uh, disabilities, if you will, at times, you know, hold back that work either. Yeah, maybe this is a good time I, I can talk about kind of church leadership and our vision and everything. So the mission of God's church is the same, hmm. right? The Great Commission, make disciples, however you want to say it, connect people with Jesus. I mean, that's the mission, really, of every church organization. Uh, that's the mission, ultimately, of a seminary to make disciples. Yeah. It's the mission of a publishing house, like Concordia Publishing House. It's, they're in the business to make disciples. Yeah. Versus a congregation, versus a Lutheran school. It's still, their mission is to make disciples. Now, the vision for these different organizations is very different. Yeah. The way a Lutheran school makes disciples is very different than the way a publishing house would make disciples or a seminary versus a congregation. Or, um, so I think that's really important. I think... Uh, Barnabas and John Mark and Paul and Silas were still in the same mission. One went to Cyprus, group, the other group went to Cilicia, and they're still making disciples. Their vision was different. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine. Uh, God gives us different gifts and passions, and, and that's fine. Yeah, if we were all the same, and uh, wouldn't be as effective. You know, That's kind of that concept of the body of Christ, right? All of us being these different parts that function together is this one body. So, all right, well, that's probably a good stopping point for today then. Thanks again for yes. joining us. Acts 15, there you go. You want to close for us Let's in prayer? Through. Let's wrap it up. Heavenly Father, we are just uh, in awe that you use ordinary people like me and Jeremy and uh, Paul and Barnabas, Silas and Judas, uh, and even uh, uh, wishy-washy people like John Mark um, that uh, you use all of us to accomplish your will here to spread your gospel to save people from their sins and just help us as our congregation and our preschool here at Desert Foothills uh, continues to do ministry in this uh, in, uh, environment that uh, we're in but as, even as we move through this and, and look to the future uh, you unite us around uh, your vision for us and the impact that we can have on our community, on our city, on the state, on the whole world. Um, help us to be open to that. Help us to be brave and courageous and bold uh, to step out and to follow your great vision. Uh, for these things, Lord, we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time. See you.